The nonfiction space is so interesting. It can be so tactical from a business side, but it can be so emotional from a trauma space. Mm -hmm. And that that individualized approach is so important for people to feel comfortable, for people to feel safe, for people to feel vulnerable. I took a lot of what I knew from working with clients, you know, over the course of 15 years of how to help them get their story out. Our ever-changing world calls upon the most courageous, resilient, and relentless of us to face its most extraordinary challenges. To help you embark on this journey, we present the Impactful Coaching Podcast, your oasis for inspiration and a beacon to spark the fires of greatness within you. I'm Joseph. I will be your ally in this journey to empower your potential. Join us each week as we dive deep into the heart of ambition, drive and success to unravel compelling stories of daring leaders who dreamed, struggled and achieved victory. Our journey begins now. How is everybody doing today? My name is Joseph and welcome back to the Impactful Coaching Podcast. It is an honor, a privilege and a pleasure to be here to collect this information, share it with all of you and probably store some of it for myself. You're free to visualize a squirrel collecting this information and storing it for the winter. Go right ahead. I encourage you to do it. I am here today with Catherine Nickel. Catherine, first things first, how are you doing today? How are you feeling? You had yourself a interesting couple of weeks lately? I have. Thank you for having me here, but I'm doing amazing. Excellent. Well, first things we got to do, it is a podcast prerequisite. If there's a podcast on the planet where they don't have to do this, feel free to send it my way. That is joseph at impactfulcoachingpodcast.com. That is Catherine. Would you kindly let the audience know what you're up to these days? What is your main line of work and what brings you here today? Absolutely. So I have been a ghostwriter now for almost eight years, It'll be eight years in September, which I'm super excited about because I promise eight years ago, I did not think that that was going to, <laughs> going to be a milestone that I would see in my business, but um, specializing specifically in memoirs, biographies, you know, really just helping people use their voice to, to make an impact. So anywhere from the capacity of ghostwriting to book coaching, again, and specifically in the nonfiction space. And just to give the audience some measure of expectation as to this episode, we're definitely going to get into ghostwriting, how people get into it, what are some of the advantages and some of the drawbacks to it. Personally, for me, just so you understand where I'm coming from, my aspiration is to be a published author. I'm pecking away at my own book. I get one chapter in each month, just so that I don't go too fast and burn out. I've made that mistake a number of times. And one of the things that has always been difficult for me to reconcile as a writer is that it is my my thoughts and my voice coming out in, in text and conveying that for other people. If it's not a matter of, I don't think I'm a good fit for this person, it's one thing, but then there's also morals and principles and dare I say ethics involved as well. So there are definitely some challenges there I'd love to hear about and how if they've been challenges for you and how you've worked through them. But before we do that, there's something that's been fresh on your mind that I wanted to share with the audience because you were at a two day mastermind in New York. I was. That, that sounded like a lot of fun. I'd love to hear what was your experience there? What were some of the main takeaways? You know, what do you go in expecting to get out of these? I'll be really honest with you. I go into masterminds with the expectation of one major takeaway. Because okay. I found when I started attending masterminds a couple of years ago, my expectations were all the way too high <laughs> and failing <laughs> to, you know, really apply all of the knowledge that I was, you know, taking away. So I've learned over the last year and a half or taught myself uh, to go in with the expectation of one major takeaway and at least one solid relationship. Because um, I believe that relationships are, you know, the lifeline of all of our businesses and mm -hmm. actually just life in general. The mastermind I was at was Selena Sue, and the topic was actually rich, rich relationships, which really tied well into my expectations. So I did, I came away with some amazing new contacts. We celebrated Laura Belgray's new book launch, which was also amazing. Um, but the biggest thing for me was really being able to identify a little bit better who my coaching clients are. I know we're going to talk a little bit later about the process, but you know, my process has always been offering consult calls because I need people to be comfortable with me and I need to be comfortable with them because like you said, sometimes we do cross some um, ethical places or places that I know I'm just not a good fit for somebody or somebody isn't a great fit for me. Um, so really helping to dial in that process is really helpful, especially when you're you know, sitting in a room of a dozen 
really brilliant minds, um, all in their own respective industries. So that would definitely be my biggest takeaway is just really refining that process instead of flying by the seat of my pants sometimes. Right. Could you actually distill it down into a a difference in variables versus the, the niche that you were appealing to prior to the mastermind versus how that niche might now be more narrowed down, more more specified. Can, did you identify a tangible difference between these two points? Absolutely. And, it, and it's also, I should mention, that's been a year long process for me. I just sure. finished my 15th book. Um, and when I first started, <laughs> when I first- started, <laughs> wait, wait a minute, she's a writer. No, that's that totally tracks. <laughs> when I finished that one and I started looking at a trend of the books that I really enjoyed the most, I had amazing clients for all 15 of them. I should note that. Um, but I started noticing a trend that just I felt a lot more passionate about. And, you know, with about my background is in social work. I spent 15 years there. So I really started tying more into stories versus the tactical, tangible side of books. Uh, so really just really refining where are those people, you know, because, I, you know, I've been really fortunate to be in a number of publications, but publications that are typically read by other entrepreneurs, which doesn't mean I don't want to write for entrepreneurs. So the bulk <laughs> of my, my client base are entrepreneurs. So, but just helping really refine where are those people hanging out outside of, you know, your typical entrepreneur, business insider, Forbes, that sort of area. Um, so that was really a process that's been happening really since the beginning of the year, but then really, you know, being able to use these masterminds too is great market research for the lack of a, a mm -hmm. fancy word, but. I, I would also surmise that one of the difficulties in trying to figure out the entrepreneurial vibe is in the geographical sense, there's probably not a lot to work with because entrepreneurs can be known to travel constantly. Obviously, a lot of the work is done remotely. A lot of companies now, a lot of companies now are almost entirely run virtually. So the idea of maybe there being a particular city or, or a place for them to congregate, to me, doesn't seem to hold water as much as maybe it did in the early 2000s. So in, in terms of them hanging out, is it an online presence you're finding? Is it a even like an email chain you're finding they're subscribing to? Definitely the online presence, because you're right, in, in person, that part doesn't matter so much. It probably hasn't really since the beginning of my, sure. my work anyways, <laughs> but yeah, so more so hanging out online. What are they reading? You know, who are they talking to? Who are they listening to? Just your typical customer persona that I really just needed to dial in and be a sure. lot more intentional with. So uh, I'll have one more question for you that is based off the mastermind, and then we'll jump into your backstory in your work in social services. So you now just give the, you and then the audience some context because I get to reveal a little bit of my personality as we go and do like a I'm Joseph episode. So I'm breaking that over the course of the next like 10, 20 episodes, but. One of my main passions is, <laughs> is is acting, but I just like being the the, the one of the guys in the background who's making faces and just responding to whatever's going on, because as as an aspiring author, we spend half the day working on set and acting. Then we might spend the other half of the day in a cafeteria area where we're just socializing, and I and I'll just have my laptop out and I'll just uh, fire away on the keyboard. And I actually don't bring my power cord as a rule. So then that way I know I'm not distracting myself with anything. So, but what I really appreciate about it is the networking that takes place there is probably the most organic networking, you know, from my point of view and from what I have access to is because there's no pretense or there's no preconceived expectations. And those are very negative words, but I, I couldn't think of anything better. So when we meet people, we're just talking, right? We're all, we all there, we're, we have a common interest, we have a common reason to be there. So the networking that takes place is an organic offshoot of that. It's not the drive, it's not the reason to go there. Some people might go do it just for the networking and more power to them. Versus when the film industry once a month here in Toronto, at least we get together and we do a film meetup. And I've I had a difficult time going to those. I didn't go to too many. I only went to the last one just because my friend was going and I wanted to meet up. So, you know, we did end up making contacts, but none of them have really flourished in a way that has now made any tangible impact on my now lived experience. So with a, a mastermind program, my guess is that it's sort of a mix. There is definitely an organic side to it, but there might also be a tactful approach to it where people do have objectives and they're going there for particular reasons. So from your point of view, how do you 
reconcile the organic or the inorganic nature or the you know i mean there's an opposite word for for organic there the more d- by design r- variation of it so what mentality do you feel like is the right mentality to go in and how do you manage expectations in terms of you know meeting your objective but also trying to let things unfold organically so what's interesting about the this particular mastermind that i attended um is that selena is really good about curating rooms of people that can really you know, that she sees merit in, we can offer value to each other some way, shape or form and some more than others. Um, so we actually have access to the contact list of people who are attending beforehand, which I've really loved that piece. And even though I know it's sort of eliminating the organic side, we're really able to start being intentional with who are the people that we want to speak with. Um, because especially in a, in a two day space, as you're really kind of cramming a ton of information and learning and teaching into you know, a short two days or sometimes a long two days, but in this case, a short two days. Um, so I really love that aspect. So even though it is sort of one remove from the organic piece, it does allow you to set those expectations that you're talking about and just being really intentional with your time there, especially in a city like New York City, where there's a million other things happening. You don't necessarily have, you know, I always say sometimes the best conversations at masterminds are the ones that happen outside of the mastermind, mm-hmm. whether it be at a dinner or you've met up with someone the next day or in that sense. So I think it's just really a matter of if you have access to the people who are going, and I think it's also okay to ask. I don't think that that's, you know, the worst thing someone's going to do is say no, sure. um, or, you know, doing a little bit of research of who who typically attends this person's mastermind, because I think that you can set an, set an intentionality with that, maximize the use of your time, because taking two days out of our business, three days, four days can be a lot. Um, and we really need to be mindful of that. And that's just really how I've sort of navigated that. Having said that, there were people I didn't think I was really going to connect with. And all of a sudden, that true organic piece happens. And you think, you know, (laughs) you're amazing. And we really need to connect outside of here. And I think it's also important to note that although we leave these masterminds, what we think are great connections or new relationships for our business or what have you, is that they require nurturing thereafter. Like the work there doesn't stop. It's not just, oh yeah, you're a great person I want to collab with and then you never speak to them again. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's really that follow through. Otherwise you're just, you know, heading into a room, you may as well be handing out a business card and leaving again. You know, we've all been to those types of events. Um, So I think with masterminds, it's just really being intentional with those relationships. And I think that's the word that I was looking for to contrast organic with being intentional, because again, I don't, I wanted to frame it in a way where it does yield positive results and people are going in with good intentions. And so that's the word that I definitely needed uh, to the point where I could go back in time and actually <laughs> do the whole, like I could just edit it afterwards. I'm not going to do that. I'm a big boy. I take my lumps. <laughs> there was actually a, a bit of wisdom that I had picked up through osmosis through some of my other client work where someone had mentioned that the first person that you make contact with that becomes your referral could manifest into a working or business relationship but if it doesn't that's okay that person becomes a referral to somebody else who becomes a referral to somebody else and then next thing you know the seventh person that person is now the person that you actually have the working relationship with so even if something doesn't seem like it's it's really tracking at first as long as you're still figuring out ways to help one another and both of you can act as referrals to each other too so and that's that's, that's the beauty of networking is that I, I I learned that very recently and I think that's an important takeaway Absolutely. Yeah. It's like a domino effect. You just never know. Exactly. So with that, I just, but I was, I was also going to say butterfly effect. And then I pictured in my head, a bunch of butterflies falling over in sequence. Why? I don't know. So (laughs) we're going to get into the social worker side of this now. So one thing that I'll want to know at this point in time is how much of an influence the idea of storytelling and writing was with you at that time. Maybe it was something you aspired to prior to. We'll want to know about that. Uh, when working with people in need of your services, did you find an element of storytelling present and how your, and I'm calling them clients. If you tell me there's a better term for it, go ahead, but how your clients talk to you about their needs. And conversely, did you find yourself using narrative to help you understand? to help yourself and to help them understand what direction they needed to go. Almost like they were telling you one thing, you could hear the story and then by telling it back to them through that filter might've helped them move into the next direction. 
Yeah. So that's a little bit tricky. So the population that I worked with were youth who were anywhere between 12 and 21, which I know seems like a really wide range, and it is, who were involved in gang violence, human trafficking, prostitution. And, you know, we always referred to them, unfortunately, as the population that no one else wanted to work with. And that was the population that I was just super drawn to. Um, and, you know, these were youth that had been through system after system that felt failed either by families or school systems or court systems or life in general. Um, so I found more than anything, and I was still in my early 20s when I started, was that a lot of them just needed an advocate. And even though they had a voice, they weren't being heard. So that's where a lot of like, not so much the storytelling side of it, but really being able to take what their needs were and make sure that someone was listening. And a lot of times people listened a little bit more when you had an advocate in the social workspace, for example. Um, so that was a big thing for me initially. But to be totally transparent, no one's in social work for money. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we often found ourselves with different part-time jobs, whether it be still in the same field or what have you. And and I just, I always loved writing. I was published in Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul years and years and years ago. Um, so I always really loved it, whether it was cathartic for me through journaling or, you know, I started becoming that person at work about, could you finesse this for me? Could you check my report for me? And I started realizing, you know, this might actually be a side gig that I could, I could take on. And that's really how that unfolded. Um, but again, from the place of really helping people to use their voice in some capacity, whether it's entrepreneurs, you know, sharing their voice for sales or conversions, or whether it's, you know, everyday people like you and I who have a story to share that, you know, have, want to inspire some way that I think inspire is one of those words that just becomes sort of inundated and mm -hmm. saying it all the time. Um, but the truth is, you know, we've really been able to watch social change happen and whether it be from a policy level or from a community level. And I believe that that's where I'm still so rooted in the social work space. And I think that's really what sets apart where I'm coming from. I know that was a long-winded way mm -hmm. of answering your storytelling question. So it was in a way sharing their stories, but again, with intentionality of we need a change to happen, whether it be getting back into school, whether it be getting into work programs, whether it be being able to go back home, you know, there's so many facets obviously to that, but yeah, so that's kind of where it, mm -hmm. it all started. <laughs> So I have a couple more questions in regards to that, and then we'll be able to use those threads and, and move into the ghostwriting and then into the coaching part of it. And I, and I want to handle these questions delicately because I didn't expect to, you know, to hear about uh, human trafficking and prostitution. I expected it to be serious. Uh, I don't imagine that there were people who turned to social work in the casual sense. So I knew that there was definitely something that, you know, people needed, um, serious help with. So when you realized you were getting into working in that field, was it more, was it thrust upon you or was it that you saw that this was the nature of the work and you were drawn to it and you want, and you knew you getting into it, this is where you wanted to provide your aid? Sure. Um, so I became a young mom at 16 um, and I was really fortunate to have resources available to me. Initially, I was definitely a rebellious 15 year old when I was pregnant mm -hmm. um, and didn't want the resources until you start realizing, shoot, I probably really need the resources. But I lived at a home here in Toronto, uh, Rosalie Hall, and I just had a really great experience there from just all the prenatal care to all the, you know, equipping you for what they hope to be the initial life skills. And just like I, I mentioned, a really great experience. And they helped me get back into high school um, where I was fortunate to do a cooperative learning program through the courts in Scarborough. Cause I knew I was somewhere drawn to the industry. I just didn't know what space. And I worked in uh, well, I volunteered on my co-op placement, uh, was at the the courts uh, local to me in Toronto. And I just really started just going, it just felt good. Even mm -hmm. though that changed a little bit as I went along, it just felt really good. I felt a purpose outside of being a mom. I felt productive. I felt like people were looking at me as an adult where, you know, you're use as a teen mom is looking, you're just, oh, that's a teen mom. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so it was really great. And I just found that I was really going against the grain of what was expected from society is where I was going to end up. 
Um, and I had a really great, really great parent, still do. And uh, they just always said, don't be a stereotype. You know, this has already happened. Just please don't be a stereotype. So in any event, uh, the court ended up hiring me the day I turned 18. I started working there full time, which again, I loved it. It was busy. It was I felt that I wanted to be able to help, but I didn't know in what capacity. Mm -hmm. um, but if we fast forward a couple of years uh, to that, I started working at another court in Toronto, big city. We have a handful of them. <laughs> and uh, I found myself clerking in front um, in domestic court a lot. And that started uh, not trigger because I had an experience like that, but it was definitely very triggering as far as the emotions that you heard in that court. And mm -hmm. You know, you'd often see the same accused over and over and over again. And this one woman, you know, unfortunately probably didn't have access to the resources that, you know, she should have had. Um, the next time I had her abuser on my docket, it was for murder. And I knew at that moment that I was on the wrong side of the bench, you know, because not to say that I could have done anything to, to save her, but I knew that there were more people that existed in my own community, my own backyard that needed help. And I wasn't going to be able to help them sitting in a courtroom. Mm -hmm. So um, I just made a very impulsive decision to go back to school and get my degree. And I did that at nighttime with the intention of not really knowing where I was going to end up in social work, but knew I was going to end up. And I just started applying to residential care. I knew I wanted to work with youth. Um, and I just started applying at residential care and then that was it. I was hired, and I spent 15 years with that nonprofit. Just because of the the, the emotional weight of the work that that you were doing, uh, how much of that has continued to uh, inform or influence your decision making process, or or how you want to act as advocates for others? And in, in again, in the pragmatic sense, is there still a, a part of you that's actively involved? Like, do you still manage to put some time aside on a week to week or monthly basis to check in and keep tabs on how things are going? I was uh, previously sitting on a board for a, um, a charity that supports women to escape domestic violence. So that was something that I did for a few years. I think that's really a big piece of me through the last few books that I wrote, like I said, that were really influencing some type of social change. Uh, so it was a really great way for me to start straddling both worlds because you know, when people come to you with stories of trauma and most of the people that come to me have some type of trauma that they want to share for whatever reason, you know, that's a hundred percent where my social work background parallels so well, which I had no idea when I, I mean, I kind of had a general idea, but I had no idea how much that would really help. And, you know, people really understand that I'm, I'm coming from a place of empathy. I'm not coming from a place of sympathy because we can be objective and, and we can really make a change. So um, I find with the new, you know, book coaching clients I work with or my ghostwriting clients that, you know, really dialing in to where I can serve them best with that professional experience has really helped um, just create a really great balance where people feel heard. But the last thing someone wants to hear when they're sharing a story of trauma with you is like, oh my gosh, that's so awful. I'm so sad. Mm -hmm. And not that those things aren't awful or sad, you know, they're looking for someone who's going to lift them up and help them use this story for good or, you know, our cliches with, you know, turning their mess into messages. But that's really where my goal is. And I think I can, I know that I come at it from an objective place and, you know, sympathy is not going to, not going to get these stories, the justice that they need to, to create some type of impact or change. Well, I, I really appreciate sharing all of that with me. And I, we are transitioning into the ghostwriting part of the story now. So if anybody wants to take, take a second to pause and uh, uh, just process what we've just been talking about, I'll understand. Uh, I'm not going to pause because um, we have, you know, we've only got so much time to, to have the discussion today, but I, I do appreciate it. And, you know, I thank you for uh, your work in the field. There is somebody down in my apartment, you know, she, it's not uh, social workers that she needs, but there are a lot of people that come in and uh, have to provide her with her basic care and necessities. And and I and I even step in from time to time is to uh, help her out in, in between just because that's what, you know, citizens should do. And and it's a huge part of our, our society. There are so many people who are really giving it all to uh, to lift up others, to provide basic necessities. And it's just something that it's always important to recognize and, and show gratitude for. So with that, Let's talk about your ghostwriting. Um, as I so, every time I see ghostwriting, I flash back, and you would probably know this because uh, you're a Torontonian like me, uh, which is awesome, by the way. I didn't even realize that. 
maybe you mentioned in an email, but this is officially the first time I'm realizing this. So I flashed back to this, I think it was a PBS TV series called Ghost Writer. Is mm-hmm. that ring a bell? Yeah, yeah. yeah so to our audio listeners, we're we're getting a nod and a smile. Um, <laughs> go, where for those of you who don't know, Ghost Rider was this disembodied phantom who would literally, a term I use in its full meaning, display text to help characters on the show. Like physically, like words would appear on screen. Very innovative CGI for the time. And now, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna give it maybe another ten years before phantom writing actually does interfere in front of us. What with the whole uh, augmented reality and uh, installing brain chips and high-tech lenses and all that. So I think we're gonna get there, but uh, not there yet. So how did you make your way into ghostwriting? And particularly, you know, how did, you know, how do you protect client privacy, but also demonstrate your proficiency in attracting other clients? Thankfully, uh, to date, my business has all been referral through somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, So being able to demonstrate that is is obviously tricky, which is why, you know, you focus a little bit more on publicity or the networking piece is important or, you know, writing your own content so people get a general feel of the type of person you are. I'm a narrative writer. I'm not, you know, a polished literature person by any stretch. You know, obviously, I've learned a lot along the way, but, uh, you know, transitioning initially, I knew that coming from social work and maybe not trying to sound like a pity party, but you don't get the credit of the work that you put in. Mm-hmm. And and it's not for pity that I say that. And at the end of the day, it's the, it's the client successes that we want to see. But knowing you're always kind of the person behind the scenes, you're the person, whether it be their cheerleader or their confidant or their support system or their resource or what have you. So for me, when I was looking at, you know, content writing or copywriting or all the names that kind of go around about it, I knew that credit wasn't, it was still something that wasn't going to be important to me. It's not what my driving force is. So I wanted to just be able to provide it in a ghostwriting situation. Having said that, almost eight years ago, ghostwriting was not a common term. So there was a lot of um, education that needed to go, you know, around that. And even now we're still learning more and more about what a ghostwriter even is. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's funny when I go through immigration at the airport and they say, you know, what's your profession? And I say, and they're like, oh, you write music? I'm like, no, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, or then we have, you know, Prince Harry's original ghostwriter blows up the scene for all of us. But client confidentiality is the utmost important for me uh, before I even share anything on a consult call with them. They have access to an NDA, a blanket one, just that I want people to feel comfortable that I'm not going to hang up this call with them or I'm not going to do all this work with them. And that I'm going to go share it somewhere else because my driving force is their story to be heard for impact and really has nothing to do with me on a credit basis. So again, a long-winded answer to your question, but I felt really conditioned coming from a social service industry um, into ghostwriting because credit or having my name in lights or what have you was never was never in the plan. Sure. And just to respond to what you said initially, because it was a matter of you know not receiving recognition wasn't an act of uh, asking for, for sympathy or pity, but it, it is still a valid uh, want on any individual basis just to have that reinforcement because in our own heads, our internal narrative is constantly spinning, which means we're our most, we're our biggest influencers. Mm-hmm. So to receive that external feedback, even periodically, it does help to make sure that our internal narrative is being spun in a way that can help us make it, make us more productive. So, you know, it is important and to, to not have that, I think is, I mean, I've been credited for some of us, I mean, it does feel good, right? So, you know, I, I, I definitely hope people get um, what it is that they need just to re- reinforce and make sure that uh, people continue in the right direction and not feel like things are being second guessed. So that's just sort of how I heard what you're what you're saying and how where that uh, took my thought process. And and I and I appreciate the the you know the ability to enter into a space where you know that recognition is going to not be an issue for you where it might be for and I'll just put myself on the spot like it could be an issue for me right like I got an ego I mean, I you know I I want to see some I, I don't want to be Osmandius and just be down to one statue and as kind of a badass quote but to have that sort of like ongoing legacy and to know that you know I've made my mark and I've contributed in some way that definitely runs through my mind so full transparency on that mm-hmm. this next question we were pre-answering it but I just want you to hear out what was my thought process as I was thinking about this concept and you know conveying the voice of another I came up with a not a related 
parallel, but one that I thought had a lot in common. So there was this book that was later made into a film uh, earlier on in the millennium called uh, Fast Food Nation. Does that one ring a bell for you? A uh, little bit. Yeah, I mean, it came and went, right? So, but yeah. in it, they talk to different people in different parts of the food industry, including what are essentially chemists who work in labs to create flavors. And these flavors are purchased sometimes multiple times by major food brands. So these chemists, you know, they're, they're, they're ghost chefs, right? They can walk down the grocery aisle and identify what products are the result of their design. And, and some of them actually found great satisfaction in knowing that they were the source of so much activity and that, you know, food does bring satisfaction and joy and sustenance to people. So uh, how would you describe the satisfaction of seeing your ability to convey someone else's voice displayed and consumed publicly and how that raises the, the status and the platform and gives that voice to other people? It's the most incredible feeling to see, you know, an author, a client author of mine really celebrate their win because it's still their story. And I think that that's the piece that really grounds me in without needing that recognition is that I've really just helped them tell their story. So when I can walk through a bookstore and I see them, you know, you're in Toronto, so you know, Indigo, there's always mm -hmm. Heather's Picks. And when I can walk through and see a client book that I've done with Heather's Picks on it, you know, or being showcased or when they get to do their author signings or it's just, it is the most rewarding feeling. I've also had a couple books go on and create real policy change in the mental health space. And that I can't tell, there's no words to how rewarding that feeling is. Um, so yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's great. And, and, you know, the same can be said too, about client work, you know, we do a lot of, you know, email, co my company does a lot of email copy or, or blog content. And, and the same can be said when, when you have a client who really celebrates and shares the work that you've created for them as them, it's, I mean, that's where the recognition lies. So let me touch on that a, a, a little further, J just now in the technical aspect of sorting out how to convey somebody else's voice. I imagine that this is a case by case basis because each individual has uh, different needs and wants and desires, but then at the same time, you also have a process to niche down and to, you know, work with the ideal fit. So. How much can you tell us ab about this process of you know, what information do you receive? Is there a, a, you know, a fair amount of back and forth, you know, from from conception to uh, let's just go with like an article, for instance, or a series of articles or blog posts is uh, how do you get to that point where you really are you know, we wearing somebody else's avatar to convey their ideas? Most of the clients that fall into that space are entrepreneurs. So we've been really fortunate that they have a lot of content that we can consume already because the bulk of the work, or at least 40% of the work goes into the research as, of who that person is. If I have clients speaking at conferences, I try to attend just because then we get a better idea of their voice inflection, how they say things, how they do things. We do a lot of correspondence through voice notes. I encourage them to do that because, you know, we can say the same thing 10 different ways and it'll have 10 different emotions. Or, you know, there's certain things that a lot of people say. I have a horrible habit of saying, you know, after mm -hmm. I say things and I'm something I'm trying to become more and more aware of. But the reality is, as humans, we all have those little things. So it's important to that that's conveyed in their writing. And the only way to really know that is with them speaking to you from an unedited lens. Because, you know, through emails and things like that, they can really edit. That didn't sound right. You typically wouldn't add, you know, at the end of things. <laughs> um, so a lot of it is done through voice memo, even if it's, you know, depending on what the, you know, we're talking about articles and, and blog posts, for example, is that sometimes their best ideas or things that they want to have included are when they are driving or when they are out on a walk or at the gym or whatever the case is that, you know, really encourage them pick up your phone because we always have our phone somewhere do a little voice memo and shoot it over to me you know we can transcribe it and and go from there so that's really the books look a little bit different there's a lot more check-in calls especially with coaching clients who are writing their own book um, i always work from a live document with those clients so that they have an opportunity to see where have we added things where have we taken things out where are we made making suggestions where are we cleaning up their story where do we need more mm -hmm. Um, so I find, and I only really started working from a live document a few years ago. Initially, that really, I don't know, made me nervous. <laughs> it felt like I had someone looking over my shoulder. But I really found that we've been able to do people's stories, articles, blogs, emails, uh, a lot more justice when they have a document that they can see that we're working from. Sure. And I can relate to live articles. It gets 
it, it's uncomfortable to say the least when like I'm looking at a Google document and then like fastidious panda has is looking over you and I'm just like, okay because I, I almost want to like chat you know what I mean like hey I know you're reading this right now here's what I'm working on I I love the idea that pe- multiple people can work on the document I'm, I'm all for that but if I could set limitations where only one person can look at a time I probably would do that mm-hmm. there's a follow-up question this one just comes from a place of intrigue I expect and I am guilty of a disparity between the way I write and the way I talk and you, you mentioned that you're a, a you knower, and I've I've been editing for like ten years, and so I've heard every variation of different personality matrices. I myself for a long time was a weller, so whenever somebody asked me a question, I'd say, "Well, that's an interesting thing." <laughs> and very recently, I'm really becoming self aware of how many times I've like ummed and flubbed and stuttered. I thought I uh, ironed it out, but I did not. It, it came to a head one time in a previous job, and I'm getting to my question, I promise. But it came to a head in a previous job where. They were transcribing and then using one of my quotes for a promotional material, but it wasn't edited at all. So all of my ums and flubs were all and and just and it's playing this inspirational music while the text on screen is like and you know um so like what what's going on there and I had to mess with this guy. This is why I want to do the editing, anyways. So have you ever encountered someone where there's actually not much of a gap between the way the person speaks and the way the person writes? And this person manages, I mean, maybe it comes in the editing, self-editing, but, and then conversely, have you seen someone that has a, an ocean of difference between the speaking and the writing? I find that in the writing, a lot of those things are left out. Obviously, we're not typing in ums, we're not typing in you knows or yeah. right or things like that. But having said that, it also depends to where where that client's going. Is this something that they're going to be speaking from stage? Or are they going to be on podcast? We want whatever the written material is to sound like them. But I can tell you a recent client, we must have removed, oh my gosh, through the entire book, at least 3000 ellipses. So I don't know (laughs) if that was just his thought process when he was thinking and he would dot, dot, dot. (laughs) But so that was kind of interesting where I, I know for me, I use a lot of white space when I'm trying to break up a thought process to somebody or if I'm moving on to another point because bulleted lists are, I don't know, they feel too. Mm-hmm. weird to me. So I don't know if that was his way of thought process in the manuscript or when he was stopping and starting again or what the case is, but that's probably been the most <laughs> transparent one because nobody talks with ellipses, so to speak, but it was really interesting to see in a, you know, a really long manuscript yeah. Yeah. how many times that that was used. But yeah, it's interesting because I think, you know, I, we totally self-edit when we write. And I think that we've become also a society that wants to type things as fast as we can, which is why we see so many different, you know, from the LOLs to the IKRs to, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever the case is that we typically don't talk like that. So I definitely think that we're seeing a huge, even bigger shift now. But what's interesting is, you know, when we look at things like voice search now, you know, it's become so much more common that we are writing a little bit more to how people speak. So I know that's totally a different topic to some degree, but it isn't all at the same time because how are people asking questions? That's how we need to be answering them. And I also find it's interesting too that the abbreviation of something can come across a very different, even though it's supposed to represent the same thing. Like if I take the time to write out for your information, it is a lot more stoic than if I just say Mm -hmm. FYI. FYI comes across more casually. So it just speaks to the evolution of language that really any combination of letters has a history to it and so there is a limit to how far the meaning distances itself from the original uh, abbreviation the original intent but it still happens and i find that very fascinating all right so let's uh let's move into the coaching side of this so i I think the first place to start with this is at what point did coaching become a part of your career how did you work that in factor that in and then you know, from your, your your history so far, also with the social work, is that I'm wondering if any of your experience with that informed how you wanted to approach coaching. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the coaching is actually something relatively new, just launched in the fall of last year. And that was just because the ghost, you know, I can only write so many books a year. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the wait list just continued to grow, which was a really good problem to have. But at the same time, I wasn't serving people the way I wanted to serve them and also feel that 
a lot of people become more comfortable as we're going through a process of, you know, I was kind of giving them ways to get started and, and it, the coaching piece just made sense because people still want someone in their corner. Uh, so when I launched that coaching program in uh, October of 2022, it's just been a real gift because, you know, there's an option now for people that if they don't, if they're okay getting started and it's absolutely done from uh, a social work place in essence that everything's individualized with the exception of the outline you know i've sure. developed a really concrete outline that i work from when i'm writing a book and something that's available to clients as well it's available on my website for that matter um, but that's something that that was something that was going to stay the same in the process but how we some people don't like zoom some people don't want to be on boxer some people would rather pick up a phone some people would rather meet you somewhere you know if we're working with someone with someone local so that process is really designed to the client um, and maybe it takes me a little bit more time to do that but i'm okay with that because especially when we're coming the nonfiction space is so interesting it can be so tactical from a business side but it can be so emotional from a trauma space mm -hmm. and that that individualized approach is so important for people to feel comfortable for people to feel safe for people to feel vulnerable i took a lot of what i knew from working with clients you know over the course of 15 years of how to help them get their story out um so that pro process is very yeah social mm -hmm. work driven <laughs> mm -hmm. um but then things like the outline and, and going through the later process is definitely more writer driven and one thing I'd like to ask about in terms of really being able to work as effectively as possible with them. So just to relate it to my, my film work. So if you want to do background, you can find your own gigs, but typically people have agencies who receive the casting calls and then the agencies pick us out and they say, all right, here's where you're going to be going. And it is going to be early. So, <laughs> and every agency has a different way. Some people are emailers. Some people are texters. Uh, one person prefers to do it old school he likes to call and i really respect that and ideologically we're the most aligned out of all the agencies but my reception is also terrible so I, as a as a matter of circumstance i've probably missed some of his calls and so despite us seeing eye to eye uh, in a lot in terms of the societal function the technical side of it has been just a total disaster so it makes it very difficult to work with them so have you found there has been trade offs where, you know, I really uh, align with how this what this person wants to say, but maybe the way this person wants to go about it is something I'm not used to and I'm having a bit of a difficulty with versus, say, situations where it's smooth sailing in terms of communication and breaking down the work. But maybe you're having a little bit more of a difficulty with the the point that these people are trying to make and the story that they're trying to tell. So the, but the, I think the broader question here, you know, to be fair is what have been the potential drawbacks? You know, what are the issues, you know, internally within your own mind or, you know, externally with the work being done that you've come across? Sure. Uh, client availability, it mm -hmm. can be the, probably the trickiest place that we've had to navigate. Um, and a lot of that is, you know, some of them are working full-time businesses, they're working full-time jobs, they have families setting that expectation very early on they have a clear idea which was something i had to develop as i went i didn't you know sometimes we don't develop things to prevent obstacles until we know the obstacle is going to exist sure. uh, but client availability has definitely been the trickiest to navigate over the past couple of years really setting those expectations as far as their time and their timelines for example when i work with uh, my book coaching clients um that's 120 days start to finish um, so there are really clear deadlines and timelines and homework and check-ins that are laid out right up front. Again, long-winded way to answer you, but availability has probably been the trickiest, but I can really, you know, get around however someone wants to communicate um, because how they prefer to communicate is the only way that it's going to work. I was about to say FYI, and I was just, just FYI, or do I want to say for information? I don't like any of them. Um, but just so you know, I'm, I'm a very pro-tangential kind of host. So if you, uh, to, to you and to anybody in the future interested in doing the program, feel free to yeah, go, um, go whatever your brain takes you. That's just my style. Do you, by any chance, uh, have a case study or two you'd be happy to share with us, confidentiality notwithstanding? Yeah, confidentiality notwithstanding gets tricky. <laughs> yeah. Um, I can say that all but one book has gone bestseller, which is also a great win for us to see. And I always lean on the last few that mean the most to me is uh, they were uh, widows of officers who had taken their life to suicide. 
and where I mentioned that they have gone on to really create a uh, policy change from moving things to not being identified as mental health leave, but to sick leave instead. That mm -hmm. uh, was a huge win. Um, unfortunately, not in this province yet, um, but I hope that that'll start to trickle over other places. Because um, again, yeah, it's tricky to share much more. Sure. Um, but those are really the stories that I don't use create impact loosely. Like I really want people's story. Everybody, every single person has a story of some sort. And there was a quote, and I wish I could attribute to who it was. I have no idea who said it, but it was your story could unlock someone else's prison. And that's always really, really stuck with me because we just never know what we share, who we share it with, when we share it or why we share it. Case study, I, I know. I was hoping I could give you a little bit more, um, but I hope that speaks to at least the social change and peace that we like to work in. And we've had other clients open up survivor parks I uh, can't give locations, uh, but parks that, you know, were parkettes and communities that allowed other people who were survivors of X, Y, Z, um, mm -hmm. that they could go and, and enjoy that. And yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting the different places that it happens. Well, I, I appreciate what you did give. And I, my, my expectations were thoroughly managed because again, this is about, you know, um, conveying somebody else's uh, voice. So I, I didn't think I was going to get the, the full <laughs> breakdown by all means. So let's say, uh, hypothetically, uh, I'm someone who might come to you as a potential client. Uh, what do I owe to myself in order to get the most value out of your services? What would you want to see someone have ready to go to uh, begin the process? The willingness to share. I mean, it, it really is. People can come to me with absolutely nothing written, nothing spoken, nothing done. But as long as they're willing to share and be honest with their share. And I know that maybe sound kind of common sense-ish. <laughs> When someone's really honest about what they want to share and that vulnerability to share it, um, that's where we can start to to make things happen. And not that I can point my finger to any one particular source of this, but society has a funny way of making the most logical <laughs> decision seem to be the most um or the, the least selected option. And you almost have to go through all of the other uh, objectives before the most logical one becomes, oh wait, actually that is the one that we're supposed to do. And just so you understand where I'm coming from with this, I was just uh, watching this video where a bunch of guys were talking about this Chris Farley joke that they're trying to do for a Saturday Night Live. And Chris Farley, the, the whole bit is that he orders like this massive McDonald's order, like 17 burgers, 17 shakes and stuff like that. And they spent all night trying to figure out like, so will that be all? And some permutation of and what else does he want to order was what, what they're trying to figure out. And then Norm MacDonald at the last hour goes, uh, why don't you just, why doesn't he just say, yeah, that is all. And nothing else he wants to order. He doesn't want anything else. And they're like, oh yeah, well that's it. That's actually perfect. There was just something about like, that was the answer that they wanted to do. And they just couldn't get to it until they had tried everything else. So uh, that's just the, the thing that uh, came up in my mind. All right, we, uh, we don't have all the time in the world left, so I do have a couple other ones on the mind, but let's, let's uh, the, I usually like the last few questions to just be you know more, more fun. So first thing I'm, I wanna get out of you is your, uh, your stance on AI. Uh, it's obviously, it's, it hasn't impacted every industry yet, but I would argue its impact on writing can scarcely be conveyed because there's so much going on with it. So are you using it? Have you integrated it into your workflow? Is it exciting to you? Is it terrifying? What's your what's your opinion on it? Yeah, so I was originally very hesitant to explore it, um, but you can't ignore something that's forever in your face. Yeah. Uh, so having said that, I would like to say, I think that AI is a great tool for writing. I don't think it's the answer, especially since um, that technology as sophisticated as it is, uh, cannot share someone's story. Uh, Cause people often ask me, are you scared? And I said, absolutely not because my main role is using someone's voice. It's not necessarily the words on the page. I mean, obviously it's a bit of both. Um, however, I think AI is a great tool for people to use, but I don't think it's the answer for everything. I think it's great for prompts. I think it's great to get your mind going. Um, there's certain instances that will use it um, in some of the, you know, descriptive work that we're doing, whether it be through um, Pinterest is a, an area that I, I like to play a lot in. <laughs> um, we'll use, you know, the AI technology there um, with our own edits, because I, I think that's where things get a little, got a little bit tricky in communities that I hang out with online, if you will. And, you know, we were seeing people really excited. I wrote a book in one day and it's like, no, actually, you didn't. <laughs> what 
I encourage people to really do, because you're not the first or last person to ask me about it, mm -hmm. is, is really understanding the intellectual property rights that go behind that, the copyright of the work people put out, um, because I don't think that that's been talked enough um, in the space. And I think there needs to be more dialogue around that intellectual property piece. And uh, yeah, that's <laughs> those are my uh, uh, censored thoughts, I guess, a little bit. But sure. um, yeah, it, it concerns me that people do believe it's the answer for everything. Um, where again, I think it's a great, a great tool that I think people should definitely play around in. However, <laughs> being really mindful of of what you're you're putting out to the world and calling it your own. I appreciate that, and and just to you know let the audience know like where my stance on it is. I definitely don't want. Uh, chat GPT to write my book for me but it has functioned as a sounding board at times where I'm just trying to get to an idea and I need help and chat GPT spits a bunch of stuff at me I've yet to take anything directly from it but it just helps me think in a way that I wasn't thinking prior to so it's actually for me it's been more image generation I've always tried to draw and I just can't hack it I can't be there's only so many things I can be good at and drawing is not one of them and so I'm using Stable Diffusion to generate panels of art for me for a, a manga that I had in mind. And the way I'm writing it is I'm trying to use the imperfection of image generation to my advantage and say, look, no, this is an AI comic. It's sort of meant to be an AI comic. So that's my, my approach to it is like, let's not let's not use this as a a substitute for something else. Let's say, no, this is a new creative medium. And it does encourage a certain kind of storytelling. So that's been my challenge with it. And that's where I want to go with that. A couple of other ones for you, and then we'll wrap this up. So writing is a solitary profession by nature. Uh, how would you impart the importance of working in groups, joining in masterminds, and just overall being social as it relates to the success and well-being of writing, up to and including just you know going to cafes and being surrounded by people when you work? Yeah, I was just going to say that is it absolutely can be isolating. And I definitely learned some tough lessons early on just how isolating it can be. And, and by tough lessons, I mean, all of a sudden, it's, you know, dark when you wake up, it's dark when you go to sleep, you've seen nobody or nothing or done anything. Um, so really building in uh, routines, even outside of writing, you know, I make a point every single day of walk, well, my dog needs to be walked every morning anyways, sure. but, yeah. you know, really making sure that that's just part of a plan before I sit down at a computer. Um, but I love what you said to your point about go, being in cafes or just being where other people are. Starbucks inside of stores is probably my most common go-to um, because bookstores are often my answer to writer's block. So it kind of is the best of both worlds for me. Um, and that's really why a couple of years ago, I really committed to attending at least three or four masterminds a year. Um, it's just getting around other people that, you know, think differently than you do think yeah. differently than you. And so, so important because, you know, isolation can be a really detrimental place, not just to you as your business, but you as a person. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, definitely being, being in those rooms. I appreciate that. And you know, this is the first time it occurred to me that Starbucks does, they are often inside of indigos and it just mm -hmm. had me thinking have they really not the thought to call them star books yet like yeah. that's that's <laughs> such a such a gimme so i don't know uh take that one guys it's free domain just <laughs> make it make it work all right so last question that i have for you uh well i mean the wrap-up question is always a wrap-up question that one's like a anyways so I, I took your online content creator quiz because who can resist a personality quiz not right. me um <laughs> so i'll tell you oh i was wondering if the one that I got maybe came across in the conversation. Um, I got the inspirational content creator. So what I, for people who are in, I was just say, Hey, take, take the quiz. It's not going to, you know, it's going to take all day. And then it, um, it, it gets you into a newsletter, which also will include a lot of uh, useful information as well. Would, are you, would you willing to share the different content creator archetypes you've identified or maybe like what archetype you are as well? Yeah, so I definitely fall in the inspirational as okay. well. Okay, cool. um, I'm not surprised. I wasn't surprised by that at all. It is based on disc personality. So it is, you know, there was some thought into it versus just creating a random quiz. Um, it's interesting. Inspirational is definitely the highest number by a landslide. I think they make up 65% of the results the last time I checked. That was really nice to see. Um, not that I don't think people are inspirational, but it's nice to know that other people are wanting to create content for that yeah. very 
season. Um, instructional uh, was a close, well, <laughs> as close to second as you could get, um, but definitely another a big uh, bulk one there. And then who do we have in there? We have the innovators. Um, that was a very small population. I'm not surprised by that because I do believe, at least my understanding is, you know, they're working in a lot more in that green personality as well, where we like numbers and charts. I don't know that we see a lot of that in the content creator space. Um, I'm sure there is to some degree for sure. Um, but I think that people that are more drawn to creating social content, blog content, um, are really doing it for the inspirational purposes. And now I've totally blanked on my fourth archetype. That's awful. Oh my gosh. You know why we spend so much time in the inspirational instructional space that I've just totally. <laughs> okay. What if maybe I'll speed run this, uh, this quiz oh and see gosh. if I can figure out what the last one is. Influencer. Influencer. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So we have instructor, inspirer, influencer, and innovator. Uh, so influencer was, you know, kind of up there with the second with instructional or instructor for the way I'm using, reading it off that, but yeah, inspirational, like I said, by a landslide. And, you know, the, the real reason for creating that quiz was if we look at how content was created even five years ago to now is that the element of storytelling was missing. And a lot of weight places, it still is missing is that we're, we're being so factual about products. We're getting better about sharing testimonials and, you know, celebrating other people's successes and, and, and things like that. But, you know, people are so drawn to the most relatable stories. And that's really where I was going with this quiz to to just really help people do that. I mean, people are going to be more relatable to you about a story you experienced you had in a grocery store mm -hmm. than they are with some, a rags to riches story. And not to say that the rags to riches stories aren't important, have a place in our space. So that was the purposes of the quiz. I'm not surprised at all that inspirational led the led the charge. Sure. And I would say too, and from the innovator point of view is that, you know, I have a bit of a rote example in my mind, but I was just relating it to the, I feel like if I did this percentage on say like a platform like TikTok, I would actually expect the results to be very similar as is just the nature of content creation. So, you know, if anybody wants to um, uh, hit me with a fire poker for this one, feel free, but there's always content that you can make in the inspirational area. Whereas in a technical side, you can show people how to change the oil on the car. Uh, you can't do that every week. There's only so many times that you can show people how to do it. So innovators do have to sort of be on the hunt for how to uh, explain and break down the next things. But there's, there's a road between one breakthrough and the next breakthrough. So those are some of the thoughts in my head. So I, I, I was expecting it. Maybe it was a little, there was a little bit, uh, less of a gap, but nonetheless, I, I do think it's, it, it all seems to check out to me in terms of what is a driving factor for a lot of creatively minded people, whether that is writing or content creating or video creation. Um, but with that, I, I've definitely gotten everything that I wanted to, to cover today. Uh, Catherine, I, I definitely appreciate your time. Um, the wrap up question as is post requisite for every podcast. If any lingering uh, thoughts, ideas, or uh, there's a stone I forgot to upturn, I'll give you the floor one more time to share any parting thoughts. Otherwise, we'll let the audience know how they can reach out to you. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I just want to thank you again. And, uh, and if I can convey anything as my sort of last thoughts is that please share your story. You know, use your voice for impact, whether it be for someone else or a bigger cause or micro macro, it's all it all matters. So that's just really what I'd encourage people to do and you included. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I, I got a I got a few years to well, I so it was funny because you mentioned that like, you know, eight, eight years ago, you had a vision for how things were going and then eight years pass. And and that's sort of how I'm going about it, too. Like I, I'm loving what I'm doing, but. I've definitely figured out that my Kaizen is writing. And so over time, I'm trying to transition into that. So, you know, I, any, I'll, I'll take, um, uh, I'll take your encouragement to, to heart and I, and I do appreciate it. Uh, just as much as I appreciate everyone who's taken the time to enjoy this content, um, sharing it and getting it out there is tantamount to a success. So I could be better at sharing things too. We could all be better at sharing things too, but any effort that you make to spread the word of the show uh, means a great deal to me. And then, of course, you can also email us. It is interviews at impactfulcoachingpodcast.com. And it is Joseph Ayani, J-O-S-E-P-H-I-A-N-N-I -N -N -I on LinkedIn, if you want to reach out and say a few words. So, Catherine, any uh, other uh, areas that people can reach out to you? Uh, yeah, my 
name is pretty much any social platform you can think of, LinkedIn included. Um, and then my website, of course, is katherinenickel.com. Uh, Catherine with a C, A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E, and then N-I-K-K-E-L. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Well, uh, mm-hmm. as I mentioned in the last episode, I am still working on my custom sign out for this. I think I got one. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Um, but there are no shortage of things that you can aspire to do. But I think no matter what you choose, you should aspire to be impactful while you're at it. So with that, thank you to everybody. And we'll catch you next time. <laughs>